I am sitting here at Café Sperl with the man, Where? Guy Kawasaki. Yeah, it's one of the uh, really traditional Viennese yes, okay. uh, you know, coffee shops. And um, Guy is here in Vienna because he will give a keynote lecture tomorrow. And um, yeah, I'm here with you to ask you a couple of questions okay. I always wanted to ask you but never got to on Twitter. Here we are. Um, first of all, I've been reading your biography on your site um, today, and um, I think you have quite a fascinating career. Uh, can you can you sum it up a little? <laughs> yeah, well, I, I worked at Apple, and I'm living off my reputation ever since then. That's the shortest summary of it. But 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 what really amazed me uh, when I read you started your you said your first job was in the diamond industry, yeah. literally cutting diamonds. Yeah, what happened was um, I went to Stanford and I majored in psychology because that was the easiest major I could find. In Stanford and after that like a good you know Asian American I went to law school because that's what my parents wanted me to do and I hated law school I dropped out of law school after two weeks so I took that year off I went back to get an MBA from UCLA and while I was there I started working part-time for a jewelry business counting diamonds literally counting diamonds and uh, I stayed at that company for five years until I saw an Apple II um, which kind of opened my eyes to computing. My buddy from Stanford was working for uh, Apple at the time and I loved what I saw. I loved the computers so I made a switch from the jewelry business basically to the software business briefly and then I went to Apple Computer as a software evangelist so my job was to convince people to write Mac software. Okay, uh, what, uh, what, got you, what got you started about computers in the first place? You said you saw, the, you saw this Apple and uh, yeah. Did, you, did you realize back then how important this technology would become uh, over the years? No, not at all. Um, the first Apple that I had was an Apple II and it had a database called QuickFile and a word processor called Apple Writer or something like that. Or Plus, the, oh, then there was Apple Works. Apple Works integrated database, spreadsheet and word processing. So it was a three-in-one, right? And it, it was like God removed the scales from my eyes because prior to that, you know, if you're in college back then in the 70s and you wanted to write a paper, you had to pay someone to type it on a Selectric typewriter. If you were lucky, the Selectric typewriter had a correctable tape so you could backspace and remove errors. And when I saw word processing, I said, wow, this is it. Um, when I wrote my first text on the computer, I instantly realized that this would change the style of writing forever because there is no more need for linear thinking, right? right. Well, and, and, you know, ironically though, with Twitter, it, Twitter is changing the style. So now we've gone from, you know, it's, it was very hard to write cursive to it was better to write with typewriter to better to write with word processor so you could write longer and longer papers. And now we've come full circle where you have 140 characters to do everything you want. So I actually think that's a better direction. Do you think that has to do with uh, this thing everybody calls information overload? You know, to break stuff down and uh, to break stuff into short pieces again? I think it's as much, you know, attention deficit <laughs> as information <laughs> yeah. overload. Maybe those are two sides of the same coin. Um, but, you know, I. I one of the main attractions for me in Twitter is that people are limited to 140 characters. Because I, I get these two, three, four, five page long emails that really they could say in 140 characters. <laughs> okay. So I, I've toyed with the idea of only telling people my Twitter address and not my email address. So, if they, so they are limited to, are yeah. Limited. yeah. You know, no five megabyte attachments, no five-page emails I and mean, life would be much better if everybody just were limited to 140 characters. I mean, you're a legend in the online world. Uh, how many emails do you get per day? I mean, like from, from humans, excluding newsletters and stuff. Uh, probably a hundred or so. Okay. Uh, so not that many. Um, and, and what I do is I have a, I, at the server level, the, the email addresses, the incoming email addresses is searched against my, my personal contact database. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're in my contact database, you get let through that filter. Yeah. If you're not, you're stopped and a, another person looks at them for me. Um, Sounds manageable this way. <laughs> yeah, most of what comes into me, well, most is spam, but uh, a lot of what comes into me, I don't need to handle. Yeah. Um, yeah. But. So I handle only the ones that are from people I already know or no one else can handle. 
Uh, and that's the, and then I have another rule. Um, I have a filter action in my email that anything that's been in my inbox for more than three weeks is automatically deleted. Yeah. And the thinking is that if I haven't answered in three weeks or they haven't bugged me again in three weeks, must not be that important. Now, I realize that that can cause problems, but it's the only way to keep my inbox under control. Yeah, and I realize that most people have a lot of trouble with letting stuff go. You know, it, it just piles up and uh, it sits on the back of your mind. The, the interesting thing about this is, well, years ago, I lost my inbox, you know, a, a few times. Hard Corruption, yeah, yeah. You know, something like that. And they were at the point, two, three hundred unanswered emails. And I noticed a very interesting thing. Nobody contacted me. You would think of the 300 people, somebody would say, you know, I sent you an email two weeks ago, you never responded, I really need to answer. Zero. 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 So then I said to myself, well, why don't every once in a while I just go and purge my inbox? Because nobody cares, really. And so this is kind of a, a medium where instead of just throwing everything away, automatically I throw stuff away that's three weeks or older. I will set up this rule when I come home. That's a very good idea. There is one specific thing I wanted to ask you about Twitter, because if I remember correctly, you were one of the first people who admitted in a in a posting or that you that you hired someone to you know take care of your Twitter account. And I personally, I think that's a necessity if you if it's if it gets that big. Well, but l let me explain because. It's not a necessity in the way you mean. Um, the way you mean it, I think, is you need, I need someone because I get so many direct messages and at replies that I need someone to respond for me. It gets too time consuming. Except I never use my ghost that way. A direct message or an at to a person is from me. It's never from a ghost. Okay. My ghosts only look for interesting, outgoing, originating tweets they ah, never see, respond so it's a monitoring thing basically uh, no no uh, the ghosts do not do any monitoring so what I'm saying is I tell my ghosts that I want to have more followers. this is my line of thinking I told my ghosts I want to have more followers the way I get more followers is to have more interesting tweets the more mm -hmm. I, the more interesting tweets is by f looking at more sites using mm -hmm. all top using stumble upon using whatever you can find really interesting websites so these ghosts they go out and every day they're using all top and stumble upon and all their other sources to find the most interesting things they can about well we ran a very popular one yesterday actually that I found was a collection of very beautiful 404 pages I saw that one right? yes, okay. yeah so that one is one that I found and I tweeted and it's because I want people to, to, to subscribe and follow me thinking that they're going to really get very interesting things from all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. Interesting 404 pages, um, this tiny little bird was discovered in Papua New Guinea, uh, two-headed cow, uh, you know, interview with Mark Zuckerberg, whatever it is. I'm finding all this interesting stuff because I want people to follow me and and so interspersed in my tweets about interesting stuff, I promote all top. Uh -huh. So the underlying purpose of me and all my activity on Twitter is to gain a following and to gain their permission to promote all top to them every once in a while. So in a sense, Twitter for me is like a media company. Um, one of the most popular shows in America is 24. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is about terrorism and yeah, know, all the Jack Bauer, yeah. right? So I love 24. But if you were to watch 24, you would see that roughly every 10 minutes there's an ad for a Cadillac, mm -hmm. right? Now, if you have TiVo, you can fast forward through the yeah. ad. But most people don't have TiVo. So if you watch 24, part of the, the, the way you pay for 24 is that you watch these commercials and hopefully once in a while you buy a Cadillac, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. So that's the same thing with me. I, I spend a lot of effort and money to create great content and every once in a while I talk about my Cadillac, all top. Mm -hmm. 
in the hope that some number of people go and see all top so that's the payment yeah um, and, and a similar model would be for public broadcasting you know PBS or NPR they run great documentaries but every once in a while they do a fundraiser yeah and so to say to say to NPR or PBS you know I loved your documentary about Vienna Austria but I refuse to listen to your fundraisers or donate money or watch your commercials the, the response to them is so how do you think we pay for this right and so you know I also I have a really sort of cavalier attitude well not cavalier cavalier is not the right I have a tough attitude yeah. So if people really complain at me and attack me on Twitter for promoting all top, for spamming them, although I don't know how you can be accused of spamming somebody because you know they're following me voluntarily. That's right? what I've always asked, been asking myself. It's ridiculous. Although you really you can't spam people. You can look in the public timeline for people talking about Austria and tell them, oh, go to Austria.alltop. So you can do that, right? Um, I think there's even a software turned up recently. I read something. Twitter hawk. Okay, so you can target. You can target. I used it that way, and then I got suspended. But that's another story. <laughs> yeah, my account got suspended once as well. I've been trying a lot of things. <laughs> so, um, you know, Twitter for me is this tool, and that's I'm willing to invest time and money, paying goals, in order to create a great stream of tweets, in order that I can advertise. That's in my mind no different than paying for the production of 24 or for the production of this great documentary about the history of Austria. Yeah, uh, I think somebody has to pay. Yeah, that's the only way it works. But um, that leads me to another question. Are you aware of the fact that the US American versus the European or especially the German speaking online market is very, very different in terms of uh, acceptance of ads and stuff because it's kind of ridiculous everybody wants freebies but people are very reluctant to the slightest form of, of advertisements uh, there's a huge difference really in uh, I think in Germany Austria in the, in the German speaking yeah. market so to say well you know as I, I was starting to say if people truly attack me in a vicious way I just block them yeah really yeah. I just block them and I, I wish blocking were two-way because right now when you block somebody on Twitter it means they cannot see you mm -hmm. I would like blocking to be they cannot see you and you cannot see them that would truly yeah. be a better block yeah that's true and then I, I would love furthermore if if I could display the people I blocked because you know how you can click and see everybody's followers yeah, there is a page shoot that which does that it's actually some some reciprocity tool I can send you the link and they have a, a little link which says show everybody you have blocked and it really? generates a nice list really? yeah 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 I, I start I send it to you it's it's very useful I've, this was the first time I, I saw this would be very fascinating yeah, obviously there is an API call you can use to to list this know. yeah That's cool. I, I was really amazed how many people I had blocked how many have you blocked? <laughs> it was like 250 or so yeah um, so uh, what, what do you think about the future of Twitter because I, I get the notion in the last six months uh, there has been tremendous changes there has been a lot of growth but there's also been an immense increase in in spam and useless messages compared to six yeah, months ago well, you know uh, I, I'm very bullish on Twitter I think it's just enormous marketing tool well, maybe some people will hate me saying that, but it is a great marketing tool. Yeah, it is. So um, I would pay for Twitter. I, w I would not hesitate. You know, people in America used to pay thirty dollars a month for 128k access to America Online. Thirty bucks a month. This is not that long ago. <laughs> no. So you know, what do I get more utility out of AOL at 128k or Twitter? I mean, it's not even close. So I think people will pay for Twitter, um, and in a, in a sense, you know, you, you hear, f and I get attacked by these people, about these purists who say, no, Twitter is a social networking, it's for engagement, it's to develop personal relationships, it's to, you know, do everything but promote spam and advertise, right? <laughs> well, if you turn back the clock about 15 years ago, you know, I guarantee you that when the first banner ad came out, when the first sponsored link came out, all these people said, you know, the purpose of the internet, well... Yeah, I remember, actually. <laughs> you know, the ARPANET scientists could say the purpose of the internet is to prevent 
the, the downfall of democracy in the event of nuclear attack. So, you know, probably some people were just aghast that Zappos started selling shoes on the internet because the internet was supposed to save America in the event of nuclear war, not sell shoes. But if you look at it, you know, so at first the internet was supposed to be pure about sharing information and now it's people sell shoes, people sell porn, people sell hockey sticks, people sell cameras. It's just, it's going to happen. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, you know, uh, it's, there's no way to stop that. Um, no. No, and, not. and indeed for the internet to have, if the internet were only Wikipedia and answers.com, <laughs> you know, how big do you think it would be today? Uh, so we, what we do is we, you know, we have information and we protect America in case of nuclear attack. Those are the two purposes of the internet. Wow. We're going to be a small internet right now. Yeah, definitely very small. So, yeah, I, 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 people just have to, you know, probably at some point when Gutenberg had the printing press and he was only printing Bibles, somebody probably said, oh my God, what if somebody prints a book of fiction? <laughs> you know, not the Bible. The printing press was made for the Bible and it's just wrong that people are printing comics and printing fiction and printing, you know, alternate interpretations of religion. Um, they need to get over it. You said before that you th uh, think Twitter is a tremendous tool and that you would pay for it. Yeah. Um, what about Facebook, especially their uh, direction towards yeah. a more and more walled garden? Um, I'll be the first to admit I don't understand Facebook. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a Facebook account. Alltop has a Facebook account. I have. 10,000 you know friends on Facebook and all that but for me Facebook is more about pull you know you need to pull I'm about pull. Pull. pull you yeah. need to pull people to your wall or pull people to your profile or pull people somewhere and Twitter is push I see and yeah. I, I need to push so we have this website you know austria.alltop tech.alltop you know you name it dot all top and I need to push people to that mm -hmm. and so Twitter really is the tool for me um, I, I don't know how to use Facebook yet yeah. yeah I just realized one thing for for uh, bloggers I think if you have a lot of friends it's it has become a quite a good traffic source for oh me my God. Yeah, you know, um, I blog for American Express uh -huh. they have a, something called the open forum which is for small business and you know their card yeah. holders and so the procedure is I write a blog post for them, but you know they don't get much natural traffic. I see. Right? I see. So I write a blog post for them about well the, the most recent one I posted yesterday was how to use Facebook as an outbound tool if you are a young person looking for a job or getting into school. Yeah. So the basis of this was you know, you read warning after warning, don't put pictures on Facebook, don't do this on Facebook because college admissions are going to look at your Facebook profile and employers are going to look at your profile. So you have to be really careful about what you put on Facebook, right? So I wrote a totally opposite article that said, you know that people who are college admissions people are looking at Facebook. You know that recruiters are looking at Facebook. So knowing this what you should do is put stuff on Facebook that positions you well for the school and for the job use it in an affirmative way instead of a defensive way if I knew that someone was looking at my Facebook profile and I wanted to get into Stanford I would show how I went and I did work study in Africa right and how I volunteered and I built schools in Guatemala and this is when I went to uh, TechCrunch 50 to learn about yeah. technology yeah. and this is me standing at the Apple store getting the you know the 3GS on the opening day because I love technology mm -hmm. and here I am you know backpacking across Europe and this is me in Shanghai learning about you know what's happening in China so that the admissions officer would look at the Facebook profile and say wow this kid is fascinating we ought to hire this person you know this is what I always thought it's a two-sided coin because everybody is afraid of you know negative uh, things but it's a perfect tool to generate the image you want about yourself. Right. so anyway it's a long story about that Facebook post but anyway so 
I made that post and then I go on Twitter and I tell people, you know, I, I, I made a post about how to use Facebook as a weapon. And I repeated that tweet at least three times. What I do, when I have something like that, I post it at, eight in, at 7 in the morning, 3 in the afternoon, 10 or 11 at night. I do it three times a day because I believe, unlike most people, that Twitter is just like CNN. So if, if you sat and you watched CNN from 8 in the morning to 8 at night, you would see that they repeat the same story. N not, not different coverage of the same story, literally the same story. The same person, the same interview, just identical. They just yeah. rerun yeah. the story, right? And so it's because someone watching CNN at 8 a.m. is not the person watching at noon, not the person watching at 5, and not the person watching at 10. Yeah. So when you cover Michael Jackson's funeral, you run the story five times a day, right? I believe the same thing is true of Twitter. But lots of people, well, not lots of people, some people notice that I do that and they get all been out of shape, like I'm repeating stories, right? So, you know, one piece of advice is that you cannot make everybody happy on Twitter. Definitely not, no. So if yeah. you piss off 10 people a day, I have 169,000 followers. I figure if I piss off 10 people a day so they unfollow me, you know, I go 17,000 days before I lose them all. Yeah. That's a long time. Yeah. So, you know, you just got to do what you got to do. I've been asking you a lot of stuff about Twitter and Facebook, but now I want to talk a bit about, about your own projects. Okay. Um, you work as an early stage venture uh, uh, capitalist, um, but I think your main priority right now is Alltop, right? Yes, so uh, what is Alltop? I mean, I know what Alltop is, but, but I want you to explain it. Um, Alltop, if you will, is an online magazine rack where we gather news by topics, and we have about 700 topics. So our goal is to find the best sites, blogs, and feeds for these 700 topics. And they go from adoption to zoology with Austria, Germany, China, food, wine, Drupal, PHP. Who made the list? You name it. Who made this initial list or are you constantly changing it? We constantly add as people ask us. I see. So if someone asked us to do Drupal and we didn't have Drupal, we would do Drupal.altop. Um, so what we want to do is provide basically RSS feed aggregation with none of the aggravation. So we've, we've aggregated it by topic and then if you care to, you don't have to, you can just cherry pick from each topic and create your own personal My Altop page. So that, that would be taking it. Now, the difference between us and Google, if, if let's say that you want it to read about travel, right? So if you type travel into Google, you would get roughly one billion hits. Yeah. The first pages would be Expedia, Travelocity, Cheap Tickets, Hotels.com. It would be all the deals, right? But none of that is interesting to you. You want to find travel blogs. If you type travel blogs into Google, you would get 250 million matches. Still not good enough. So our goal is you go to travel.altop and we have assembled the best 300 or so travel blogs already done for you. We display the last five stories. If you mouse over the headline, you see the first paragraph of each story. So what we're trying to do is create a situation where it's very easy to find the best feeds about any topic. The quality control, control is done manually, so it's someone is looking. Manually. It's, there's no computer algorithm, there's no dig function. It's not the wisdom of the crowd. It's a curated model. So it would be like if you went into a museum and the way the stuff is picked that goes into the museum is because of the director of the museum like Degas and not yep. Chagall or you know whatever yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. So yeah. it's that person's vision and passion and pick the museum. That's very different than saying so I went to this museum and the stuff that was on the front wall in the museum was because more people voted it up than down. I see, yeah. yeah I see what you That's mean. not how we work. I want you to know that at all top, if you add RSS to any address, you'll get an RSS feed for that topic. Oh, nice. If you add OPML, yeah. we'll export the OPML. So for example, let's say you, really, you use Google Reader. 
but you love what we did for tech.altop. So you want to know every feed in tech.altop. So if you went to tech.altop.com and, and added slash OPML, we would export the file of every RSS feed in tech.altop that then you can import into Google Reader. Ah, nice. So that's a little known tip for you. Yeah, but this is not very helpful for your business model, right? Yeah, but you know, truly the, 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 the target for all top is probably not you, you know. So let, let's say that, what's something your parents are interested in? Let, well, let's say they're interested in wine, okay? Yeah, yeah they are, they actually are. <laughs> so one day your mom calls up and says, you know, son, I really are interested in wine. Help me find all the good wine stuff on the internet. So at that point you can say, well, mom, go to Google, type in wine and she'll get 900 million matches yeah. and she'll hate you. Uh, another thing is you can say, well, mom, uh, go to Google and set up an account and get iGoogle and then type in wine into Google and look through the 900 million matches and you'll find some interesting stuff. When you find an interesting site, look for a little orange thing that has little waves in it. That's the RSS symbol. Click on that. It'll subscribe it to iGoogle. Then from then on, every day, go to iGoogle and look at the new wine articles, right? The odds of your mom pulling that off, well, maybe she's a PhD in computer science, but the odds are pretty low that she's going to do all that, right? So now, all you have to do is tell your mom, you want to find about wine on the internet? Go to wine.altop. If you really love your mom, you could go to Alltop, create a My Alltop account, you know, slash your mom's name, mm -hmm. right? Pick the ones from wine that you think she'd like, pick the ones from travel she'd like, pick the ones from food she'd like, pick the ones from austria.altop that she'd like, put your blog in it and say, Mom, I created you this custom page of all the wine, food, and, and your son's blog so you can keep on top of all this at one page. So the point here is it's not a geek product, it's, it's a, a very mainstream, ah, okay, that makes product. extremely like much you. sense. People like you probably use NetVibes, PageFlakes, iGoogle, Google Reader, my Yahoo, mm -hmm. right? Or you use NetNewsWire or you use some feed reader, yeah. most likely. Yeah. I, I don't think I'm ever going to get people like you necessarily. But when your mom calls and says, I want to read about wine, yeah. I hope you're not going to tell her to go get iGoogle and subscribe to Wine Blogs because yeah. that ain't going to work. No, but that sounds like a, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That's, yeah. And you know, I think there are more people like your mom than you. Probably. <laughs> so yeah. that's the market I'm after. You've been blogging for quite some time and uh, recently or during the last month, I, uh, some people were saying, Twitter is much uh, more convenient than blogging or Facebook. You, we don't need blogs anymore. What's your take on that? Well, I, I don't think it's the case where you don't need blogs. Because, like, for me to write an essay about how to use Facebook as a weapon, I can't do that in 140 characters. I can use Twitter to promote that blog yep. post to drive people to it. So I think blogs still um, serve a very good purpose of, you know, 500 to 700 words. There's one more factor, it's the third party versus self-hosted. I mean, I think if you spend a, if you do spend a lot of time, work, it's, a, it's always some danger involved if you only rely on third party services. You yeah. never know what's going to happen. Yeah, yeah, it, uh, that's a, another good point, yes. yes. So you, your, your point is because of the downtime or? Not just the downtime, but uh, maybe not, not Facebook and not Twitter, but smaller services might disappear, they might change their policy, they might like Facebook did, uh, they, you were not able to pull your own status RSS feed anymore. So, Is that true? Yeah. What? They, they changed it a couple of months ago and uh, I didn't know that. tried a couple of workarounds. It's not the only thing you can Why do is. Walling, walling the garden. RSS feed? No, no, not even your own because in the, they. they uh, we didn't want to allow to pull the whole feed. There are privacy issues involved, obviously, but I think there are no privacy issues with your own feed. Yeah. So ac actually, if you want to do that, you got to use Ping FM or some some service like that, and you know, use a duplicate from some other service just to to list your status updates. There is no official way. There is one very important question I have to ask you. And in your personal career, you were very successful at Apple, and then there must have been some point when you decided uh, you want to leave the corporate world. You want to become an entrepreneur and do your own thing. Um, how did this point uh, wow. come to happen? You know? 
There's two versions of this story. So one version is that I realized that my job was done and so I decided to leave Apple and start this company to do this relational database. The other version or 4D, of 4D, yeah. yeah. The other version of this story is that about six months before I left, I was up for a promotion, and the person who I worked for told me that they weren't making me a director because Microsoft Lotus and Ashton Tate didn't like me. All the other developers liked me. The smaller developers liked me, but Microsoft Lotus and Ashton Tate didn't like me, so I wouldn't get a promotion. And I was so morally and intellectually offended by that because Ashton Tate was doing a lousy product for Macintosh, Microsoft was copying the user interface, and Lotus just didn't care about Macintosh at all, right? So if you ask me, those three people should have hated me. So I was so offended by that that I, at that moment I decided to resign. So I went back and I saw Jean-Louis Gasset and, and I said, Jean-Louis, I'm going to resign because this pissed me off so bad. And he said, don't, don't resign, resign, don't resign. Um, there's going to be a reorg, you're going to be working for me. The next chance on your review in six months, I'll make you a director. Oh, I said, okay. So then he made me a director on like April. It was about, literally, I think it was March 30th. And then on April 1st, April Fool's Day, I resigned. <laughs> okay. So I resigned like the next day. So that now on my resume, I can say director Apple Computer instead ah, of, you know, manager. Did, did anybody believe in an April Fool's joke? No, it was, I really resigned. <laughs> okay, so. okay. So that's how it happened. So I, I guess you never regretted that decision. No. Well, I don't, you know, if, if I had stayed at Apple, I left in 87. If I had stayed till this day, I would have made hundreds of millions of yep. dollars. So, you know, then I might not be in Vienna today, though. Yeah. By the way, how do you, how do you like Vienna? Have, have you seen a lot? So I've only seen the airport and this coffee shop in my hotel room. So. Okay. So that's yeah. yeah that's I like this coffee shop. Yeah. But you got two more days, so you'll you'll have time to see some spots. The market. What's the market Nash called? Market. Yeah. I'm yeah, gonna go to that. Near, I'm gonna go to that tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you. Thanks a lot. Is there anything you right. wanna wanna tell my readers? They visit all top and check it out. Yeah. You know, so that's that would be most important for me. Thanks a lot for the interview. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, this is Guy Kawasaki, and I'm sitting here in Vienna, Austria, and I want to uh, encourage you to read and follow Data Dirt. <laughs>